So uh, I'm going to be focusing uh, more on uh, urban strategies for harvesting water. And uh, as I start, I want to ask the question of what is the story of this place? What is the story of whatever place you find yourself in, where you live? And what is the story of water where you live? Because that is your story. That is our story. Because we are over 70% water. So we are walking, talking water. So I want to tell you one story of my place, my community of Tucson, Arizona, and how it relates to the story of many of you. So if you look to the uh, image on the left, it was taken in 1904. Uh, back then, our community, our watershed, acted as a sponge. So we had wonderful bosques or forests of mesquite, cottonwood, willow, and acacia trees that would absorb and diffuse the falling force of the raindrop. Whatever water made its way through the canopy would then be absorbed by a sponge-like layer of mulch and organic matter below. So back then we had two rivers that flowed year-round, the Santa Cruz and the Rito. The water table was just a few meters below the surface. Uh, we had abundant springs and artesian wells throughout the community. But now we have replaced the sponge with pavement. And so the image on the right is what Tucson looks like today. We've lost both rivers, the water table has dropped over 100 meters, uh, and we've killed all the springs and artesian wells. And we have done this by over-pumping, over-consuming our local water resources while simultaneously crippling the watershed's ability to naturally recharge itself by removing the sponge and replacing it with pavement. So when we then look more closely at our watershed within the community, you see that we are a hydrophobic society. We're afraid of water. We must be, because we are creating infrastructure that is dehydration infrastructure, getting rid of the water as quickly as possible, the free, high-quality rain that falls from the sky. So typical uh, uh, service area is 95 to 100 percent paved in a commercial development. Residential developments send the water off the roof, past the landscape, into the street, and the guns of Navarone shoot the water out of the system. So you could call this not only dehydration infrastructure, but dysentery infrastructure. And here's the dysentery. So floods that used to occur every 100 years are now occurring every 10 years. But the rainfall pattern hasn't really changed. What has changed is the watershed. So instead of absorbing the rain when it falls, it sheds it off quickly, contributing to peak flood flows, which is a real liability for the community and traffic as it floods the streets. But it's a real boon for the urban um, uh, tourism attraction of runoff kayaking. Uh, and I, that's my neighbor after he passed two vehicles on my neighborhood street. Um, and as we rapidly drain the free, high-quality rain that falls from the sky, we then look to much more expensive uh, and damaging strategies to pull distant water uh, at great expense because we have ignored or expelled the free local water. So this canal uh, brings water from the Colorado River to my community of Tucson um, at a great distance, um, and it is the largest consumer of electricity, the pumping of the water through this in the state, and the single largest source producer of carbon emissions. So are we really consuming water, or are we consuming carbon? Uh, and just one other point, and the greater the distance that we transport any resource, be it water, food, energy, um, the greater the negative impact, and often the worse the quality. So as we import this water from elsewhere, we find it gets ever saltier. As we pump water from greater depths, it becomes saltier. As we apply that salty water on the landscape, it becomes harder for plants to photosynthesize, harder for plants to uptake water. So by irrigating, we create more drought-susceptible landscapes because of the water we choose to use. So that story is the story of a degenerative ruin. That story is of a community that is sending itself in a downward spiral. As we ever deplete our local resources, 
become ever more dependent on imported resources, we are undermining the carrying capacity of our ecosystem. So I then ask, is that really the story of this place? Is it my role to contribute to that story? Is that our calling? I don't think so, and I don't choose that story. It turns out that more rain falls on the surface area of Tucson in a typical year of rain than the entire community at home, at work, at school, um, and industry consumes of municipal water in a year. And yet we don't see that rainwater which exceeds all the municipal groundwater and imported water we consume. It's the same story in Amman. So in Amman, the citizens are much more conserving than they are in the US. On average, just 130 liters of water per person per day is consumed. And that, but if you look at the rain that is falling on Amman in a typical year, 272 millimeters, if you were to take that annual rainfall and then multiply it by the surface area of Amman, divide it by 365 days a year, and divide that by the population, you would find you have 441 liters of rainwater per person per day. If you could capture that rain that falls on Amman and distribute it over the year. That is a different story. We can choose whatever story we contribute to, whatever story we live. And I see two paths to two different stories. One is the path to scarcity, which drains local resources. If this were the typical household scenario, we're draining rainwater, stormwater out of the site, creating sediment-laden flood flows, creating liabilities downstream. We send our so-called wastewater, our gray water, out of the system as well thereby uh, continually depleting the carrying capacity of the system. But on the other hand, with just a few tweaks, we can turn that around. And instead of draining local resources, we can harvest local resources, thereby greatly reducing or even eliminating our need to import resources from elsewhere. And here, instead of planting on mounds, we plant within basins that capture rain, capture runoff, which turns runoff into run on, which is right on, and then it soaks in. We can also capture gray water, um, so in times of no rain, these rain gardens become gray water gardens, or air conditioning condensate gardens. And uh, these same earthworks, these uh, resource nets, these depressions, which aren't depressing at all, um, they uh, capture leaf drop and recycle the biomass, the nutrients, back into the soil, thereby enhancing the fertility over time. So things get better over time. We don't get sad, we get happy. Maybe so happy, sorry folks, you want to take these here buns and do a little bun dance on the path to a bun dance. And I like to begin just looking at using the water within the landscape, because we don't need to worry about purifying the water to drinking water standards. Um, we can start there. And since tanks are often an expensive proposition, if we can at least minimize our need for water within the landscape with earthworks, we might be able to get by with a smaller tank or utilize the tank water for other sources. So these typical earthworks, particularly in the urban environment, um, I call rain gardens. Oftentimes, uh, in flat sites, they're level bottom basins with mulch and vegetation. The sponge that rapidly absorbs water, and then when we want to access it, we do so in the form of the fruit, the shade, the shelter, and so on. Uh, and when you want to figure out what to plant where, go take a hike. See what naturally grows in your low spots. Those are the species you want there. What needs better drainage? Uh, say like a fruit tree, plant it high, but where the roots can access the water, so you get no crown rot, but you good, get good production. This is a, uh, here is a development uh, in Tucson, Arizona, uh, that is util utilizing these strategies. So here, rooftops drain to a common landscape, which has been broken up into a series of 60 centimeter deep basins. Uh, that, in that photo there, you can see pooling water uh, just after the rain. 
uh, that would be a problem, breeding mosquitoes uh, and losing water to evaporation. But we don't have the sponge. It's just bare soil there. So then putting the sponge of about this much organic mulch over the surface, the living pumps of vegetation, which more quickly with the roots draw down the water and then pump it back up in the form of, again, the food, the shelter, and so on we can utilize. Uh, we have subsurface water instead of surface water. And in the dry land environment, that is key. So we hide the water um, from the evaporation. This is an overview of that site. Um, all these squares with numbers are the buildings. The shaded area is the common landscape. The circles are the trees. The slope is from the lower left to the top right. But there are no storm drains on this site because there is no water draining from this site. All of the rain falling on this site is absorbed by the site. This is not dehydration infrastructure. It is rehydration infrastructure. It is uh, infiltration infrastructure. So um, the, uh, uh, we have found that all the, uh, the micro basins, those 60 centimeter deep basins, when you add up the storage capacity of them all, it exceeds a conventional stormwater system in capacity by 10 times. But the great thing here and where it gets into the permaculture bit is it's not just a, a superior flood control system. That is also the foundation of a water sustainable landscape where the landscape is irrigated now that it's established only with passively harvested rainwater and recycled household wastewater from on site. No drinking water. Uh, looking at an overview of a, a single um, building, the key here is we want to harvest the water as close as possible to where it falls. I'd say within 30 meters, but 10 meters away from the, uh, the, the wall so we don't saturate the area under the building. This way, we can, turn, we can increase our available rainfall. So uh, we can double the amount of water available in this area because it gets the water that falls from the sky plus the water from the, surround, the adjoining hardscape, in this case, the roof. Uh, and we can augment it with gray water as well. Uh, this is just mimicking a natural pattern. This is a, uh, a roadway in uh, southern Arizona, a very dry area where we only have creosote plants growing, typically no trees, but yet we have this belt, this forest of mesquite and acacia trees growing where nobody planted them, nobody takes care of it, yet it's there, it's thriving. How is that possible? It's because of it gets all the rain that falls from the sky captured in a roadside swale, augmented and doubled by the runoff from the street. Plant the rain, and the plants will plant themselves. We have other waters beyond rainwater. There's also air conditioning condensate. So particularly in, in dry land uh, cities such as Cairo or Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, which are very humid but have very low rainfall rates and uh, many air conditioners, um, this is a water to capitalize upon. So it may not be much from a home air conditioning unit um, in a dry climate. It may only produce one liter of condensate a day. But if you bump up from a dry climate to a more humid climate or season, that can up to 68 liters a day just for that small household unit. And if you uh, get a commercial unit in a dry climate, 1,900 liters a day or over 7,500 liters a day in a humid climate. And this is a photograph taken in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. I don't know if it's showing up, but uh, an enterprising individual put a funnel and a hose to every one of the drains on the air conditioners, pulled that condensate into the courtyard garden, and is using that to uh, irrigate his plants. And uh, I want to point out that condensate, just like rainwater, is naturally distilled. There's no uh, salt, um, unlike our surface waters. So it's great to flush the salts out of our soils. Um, this is a couple photographs of the entrance to the Austin, Texas City Hall. There is this huge waterfall feature as you walk in, and all the water flowing over this waterfall comes from the condensate dripping out of the air conditioning units on the roof of City Hall. And, uh, I love that uh, it's all this recycled water, but it could go much further if instead of just having the ornamentation, if it were also growing food with that water, also growing shade with that water. And then there's gray water. 
So we can take the household so-called wastewater, I don't think there should be such a term as wastewater, um, and uh, we can take the water from our sinks, bathtubs, showers, and washing machines and direct that out into the landscape. And I like to harvest and the, the free resources. So when I capture the water, I like to do so with gravity-fed distribution. So we can just slope at a 2% slope our pipe from the house to the landscape, thereby storing no water in the pipe nor in a tank. Because if we store gray water in a tank, it turns septic. It can go become anaerobic and become black water. Uh, and the water is caught again in the level bottom mulched uh, rain garden uh, and turned in, into food. Um, okay. Uh, I think it's key that we distribute this gray water to multiple points instead of focusing it in one area, thereby lessening the chance of the soils going anaerobic and keeping the soils aerobic, lessening uh, odor. Uh, and uh, so here you can see we keep the bathroom water on one side of the house, laundry water on another side, and then we split that flow multiple times with a gradually sloping pipe to distribute with gravity. Uh, with a laundry system, I like to do a multi-pipe where I've got the washing machine, there's the sewer pipe if I have a sewer, and next to that I have one or three additional pipes, each going to a different tree in the landscape distributed with gravity. So every time I do a load of wash, I move the drain hose into a different pipe. Um, this works great, distributes the water. The only problem is if you really like oranges, um, and uh, you also have a drain going to the apple tree, you may never send the water to the apple tree. You may always send it to the, the orange tree. At least that's what I do. Okay, and uh, I like to outlet the pipe above the mulch so there's an air gap, no roots grow into the pipe and clog it. And the other key thing here is I want to show the flow. Uh, a lot of policymakers are afraid of gray water harvesting, thinking that it will uh, worsen public health. People might come into contact with gray water and diseases. But there is no recorded um, uh, case of illness from gray water. I'm not talking about black water. There's no recorded case of illness from contact with gray water. And in fact, I find people's health improves if they harvest gray water because they notice if they send something down the drain that kills the tree, they stop using that. And that same thing that'll kill the tree will kill them. So the, the great thing is it reconnects us with where things go. Um, it reconnects us with the cycle. The water harvesting reconnects us with water comes from. The gray water harvesting reconnects us with where the water goes. Uh, this is a landscape in Tucson, irrigated entirely by rainwater and gray water. Um, no, uh, drinking water, water from the roof to the mulch basins along the, uh, the property line. Slope of the path away from the house so there's no flooding. Gray water from the washing machine to three different points. Um, okay, and it looks great. Okay, and then let's look at water budgets. Supposing we have 34,000 liters of water coming off our roof in a typical year of rain. That would be enough water to sustain three low water use native food producing trees, such as the carob here. All you would need is the passive system to capture the water, infiltrate it, and passively irrigate the trees. But if you wanted a more water consumptive tree, uh, say using 30,000 liters a year, you'd only get one tree, not three, because we're trying to live within that budget. And it's not adapted to the dry season like the natives, so it needs supplemental water in the dry season. We can supply that with gravity-fed gray water. So that's cool, but it's not cool enough, OK? So there's no integration there. So what if we took that roof runoff and we first sent that 34,000 liters into the shower? We could get over 900 five-minute showers and then send the gray water from the shower to the landscape. Or we could send it to the washing machine and get 750 loads of clothes washed and then send that gray water from the washing machine uh, to the landscape. So we get a lot more for a lot less. And the Australians have made this easier um, with some technology and that now uh, in the major cities of Australia, you cannot build a new home unless you have a rainwater harvesting system. Uh, the water comes off the roof into the tank. As long as there's water in the tank, it goes to the outdoor faucets, toilet, and washing machine. Not to the uh, kitchen sink, so you don't need to worry about drink, uh, filtering it to drinking water standards, although that's not hard to do at all. Um, 
And uh, this then acts as a flood control system because in the wet season, you are flushing your toilet or uh, washing your clothes, so the water table drops in the tank, allowing more water in. So it goes into the tank, not the street. This also creates beneficial redundancy. Pick your favorite catastrophe, being it a terrorist attack, uh, earthquake, tsunami, whatever. If the, uh, the mains go out, you still have all these water tanks throughout the community providing backup. Um, okay. And Amman is, uh, and much of uh, the Middle East and the world is, uh, is already set for this. There's already a tank culture. Um, as you see, the water trucks um, delivering supplementary water or water tanks on the roofs to capture the uh, sporadic municipal water as it's delivered, there's already uh, a contextual experience with the tank water. But here, as is the case in Arizona, there is so much moving of water from one place to another that 17% of the national energy production in Jordan is just used for pumping water. What about the rain? So Sameh, he uh, loved his presentation, and I had the honor of visiting him in his village and uh, being presented with rainwater tea, the only tea you will get in his village, and I've never had any tea better than that. Um, and uh, a local imam uh, told me that uh, he, rainwater is the best for him because it is the water from Allah. And... Uh, I also love that not only is there this direct connection with the source, um, and this, this being the highest quality water, but also this wonderful connection of the Roman era and Byzantine sisters, cisterns being revived to be used again for the household water supply for modern homes. Um, it's a wonderful connection of the past to the present. And uh, Mohammed Ayesh uh, took me to another site here, uh, north of Amman, where it seems that when people dig the foundation for a home or dig the hole for a tree, they're always finding cisterns, okay? And uh, so they pepper the landscape because it's an appropriate uh, strategy for this landscape. Uh, and now I want to look at stormwater. So uh, this is my brother and I's home in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, right after we purchased it, we got a great deal on it because it was about to be condemned. And uh, opened the front door, it fell into the front room, opened the window, it fell into the yard. I sat on the toilet and I fell through the floor with the toilet. Uh, but this was great because it enabled me to see the plumbing. And, and it was horrible. And, uh, but the most horrific part of it was, although I knew this before falling through the floor, I didn't fully know it. And I saw the pipes coming from the water mains to the kitchen sink, to the bathroom sink, to the bathtub, and then the toilet. So it was that sudden irrefutable realization that there is drinking water in the toilet and I was crapping in drinking water on a daily basis, turning a pristine resource into a toxic waste. I was constipated for years after that. But thankfully, I discovered the technology of composting toilets, and I want you to know I'm quite regular when around such technology. <laughs> so uh, the, this is what, uh, not only was the house in bad shape, but so was the, the neighborhood. And so uh, much of it looked like this, just a barren solar oven. Uh, we had a very divisive neighborhood, lots of infighting. People were not talking. We had different neighborhood associations in the same neighborhood. Um, so my brother and I moved in, being the, uh, the, the ignorant ones, and we would wave to anything that moved uh, in the hope of being friendly. And uh, we knocked on doors, and we uh, had potluck dinners with those that would speak to us, and that number grew as we had gatherings. And we, as we talked, we asked one another, what do we want in our community? And the answer was, we want more life. We, we want community. We want to be talking with one another. We want life. So we organized an annual tree planting project, but having learned from Mr. Zephania Piri Maseko, an African water farmer in Zimbabwe, uh, you must plant the rain before you plant the trees. So we create water harvesting earthworks, rain gardens, 
And then, after planting the rain, we plant the trees. And by doing so, in just 10 years, this became this. And, and this is irrigated now that, it, after three years of establishment, uh, it went to being irrigated only with passively harvested rainwater and street runoff. No outside inputs. Um, no drinking water. And the, uh, it's much more than just greenery. We found it's a living air conditioner. We've reduced temperatures uh, along this strip um, by about five degrees Celsius uh, compared to what it was before. Uh, and before we had almost no native bird life, now planting over 90% of the plants as food producing, medicine producing native plants, uh, we've got over two dozen native bird species that have returned as their habitat has been brought back to the urban core. And it's fought crime because now neighbors want to walk through this. So we know far more of our neighbors from the tree planting itself and those that walk by to, uh, to enjoy this. And it's also flood control. So we found that every time this, it rained, the street flowed like an ephemeral creek. So let's recognize it for what it is. It is an ephemeral creek. So we cut the curbs of the street to allow street runoff into street side basins, the bottom of which are lower than the street. The, uh, these fill up with water once full, they back up on themselves, no more water comes in, and the surplus goes to the next one. The path is as high or higher than the top of the curb so we don't flood adjoining properties. Um, and it turns out uh, that in my neighborhood, um, where we just get a, a, a little bit more rain than Amman, um, the average neighborhood street receives over 3 million liters of rainwater per kilometer of street. That's just the rain falling on the street. 3 million liters per kilometer. That's enough rain to passively irrigate um, uh, 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 trees spaced every eight meters on both sides of the street. So do you see it, folks? Every street could be a passively shaded green belt producing food, medicine, wildlife habitat, cooling, juicy community building, um, all on what was previously seen or not seen, wastewater, stormwater, free water, local water. So here we are building more community with the Girl Scouts planting the tree. Ten years later, uh, uh, or a few number of years later, that same tree getting passively irrigated by the street runoff. And then that tree, uh, this original tree, ten years later with my sister-in-law harvesting the mesquite pods, much like the carob tree, um, that we grind up into a naturally sweet edible flower that also uh, um, reduces the cases of diabetes and hypoglycemia because like most native foods, it slows the body's intake of sugars. So this is, this is health harvesting along with everything else. And what's more is we find that 40 to 60% of the solid waste stream in our community and many cities around the world is mulch. Okay, so when people prune the, the trees and whatnot, it goes to the garbage. But we are putting all of that into the basins below the trees from which we prune the vegetation. And we've been doing, um, graduate students at the University of Arizona have been doing studies on this, and they are finding that the soils of the city typically tend to be very degraded, with very little life in the soil. But within these basins along the street, they are finding that it is the equivalent um, soil food web. It is the equivalent so uh, soil ecology of a mature forest. So we've got huge numbers of beneficial predators, huge numbers of beneficial fungi. And we are finding that the fungi um, are so, um, cooperating with the root systems of these plants and quadrupling the surface area of these plants, thereby enabling them to uptake much more soil moisture than they would without those associations. And we did it all by turning wastes into resources because those great fungal communities, they need the mulch for their habitat. Okay. And uh, so we were getting really excited by this, okay, but we wanted to take it to others. So we organized uh, uh, an organization called Desert Harvesters. And we find that these native foods, while they're super tasty, super healthy, they're hard to process sometimes. So we got a hammer mill that rapidly grinds up mesquite pods into naturally sweet edible flour and we take it around to different neighborhoods. So we've got the convenience factor for the convenience addicts of the modern world. 
And uh, around these milling events, we have mesquite pancake breakfasts with prickly pear syrup. So even the people that have not harvested the mesquite pods, they can come, they can eat it, they can get excited like that guy, and they want to do likewise. So we give them the information on how they can plant the rain, then plant the trees, then plant the mulch, and on and on. Um, and we have found this to be a great uh, economic engine. We have timed uh, ourselves and our neighbors picking the mesquite pods grown in our neighborhoods, grown from neighborhood water, and we are making over $25 an hour, never leaving our neighborhood, just picking the pods, grinding them in the neighborhood, and selling them at neighborhood events. This is leading to a larger uh, building of economy because we, whether or not this is sane, we have people flying in from Canada and elsewhere around the world to eat these pancakes, okay? <laughs> So that's probably offsetting all the beneficial carbon sequestration of the trees. <laughs> but the point is, this is an attractor, okay? This is, these, these rain gardens are far more than a net of water, nutrients, food. It's a net of people want this. They want this reconnection with the local, this enhancement of the local, and it's available to us all. And then we've got this cookbook that shows you how to do it. Uh, you can go to the website for more. And uh, just want to start wrapping up here. Although this is not a slide from within the city, um, this strategy is doing what all the other strategies I've presented today do. It's slowing, spreading, and sinking the flow of water. And we want to rally against the mentality of pave it, pipe it, and pollute it. And we instead want to, everybody after me, slow it, spread it, sink it. Okay, let's try that again. Okay, so after me, slow it, spread it, sink it. That's better. Yes, okay, because as Brock Dahlman, the originator of that pun, says, we need to ensure that we penetrate, that we infiltrate all of our seemingly impervious headwaters and you just started to do that. <laughs> okay, so uh, this, is a one rock, or this is a loose rock check dam that was put across the flow um, of a drainage way that used to have no vegetation, it was just bare bedrock. But by, slow, by slowing the flow, it uh, allowed sediment, seed, um, whatnot to drop out, create a level spongy terrace behind it that rapidly absorbs water, slowly releases it. Uh, and it filters the water, and thereby we can just drink straight from the spring that it has formed without filtration in an area that um, is prone to giardia. And uh, so what I love about this is no spring existed before the slowing, spreading, and sinking of the flow of water. Now one is, exists because of that simple structure. Uh, and it's, all it's not increasing rainfall, it's just slowing, spreading, and sinking the water. And so, when I started this talk, I was showing you how, as we all too often see, we've killed rivers, we've killed springs, we've killed um, aquifers. But we all have the power to create springs, to bring back rivers, to bring back aquifers. Okay. And that is what keeps my buns shaking all through the night <laughs> with delight. So, just to, to wrap up, Entirely, I want to come back to the questions that I asked at the beginning. And I want you to ask yourselves this. So wherever you find yourself, wherever you live, what is the story of that place? What is the story of the water where you live? And what is your role in that story? And remember you get to choose the role. You get to choose the story. And it's my hope that you all choose the story and the path of sustainable abundance. Thank you.